In the last video where I talked about the WWE's lack of a franchise player, how they've lacked it for many years, and how it has been detrimental to the product and continues to be so, there was just this sneaking suspicion or feeling that I had that a segment of the people that were going to watch that were going to focus on the fact that I did not reference John Cena as being a franchise player. And... Ultimately, especially once I tweeted out the comparison of him to Joe Flacco, that seemed to make some eyes roll, and so on and so forth. And why am I not surprised? I am not. After so many years of being pounded with this pro Cena propaganda, I'm not surprised that people started to actually buy this crap. After so many years of people starting off as kids watching the product, and that's the reality now, because Cena was at the top for over a decade, so you got guys that started watching them when they were six, seven, eight, nine years old that are now in their late teens, early 20s, that he's their reality. He's what they know. He's their measuring stick, so they think this is the way things are supposed to be. You've got a lot of Cena stands now that have almost been beaten into submission. That's the way it feels like. Like, I was never one I don't believe to be known as a massive Cena hater. I don't think I've ever been known as a Cena fan. Um, it's, it's kind of been an up and down over the years, depending on what it is, but a lot of frustration, sure. Tried to have some fun out of it with all the Breakfast Club crap, but ultimately a lot of frustration. And maybe this is just a matter of perspective, and it's going to lead to a difference of per opinion no matter what. And if that's the case, I don't care. Fine. But my definition of a franchise player is somebody that you build your entire organization around. And not just build it around them, but build it around them and you're successful building around them. The type of guy that can instantly change your fortunes or elevate you or take you to another level or help you to enjoy this at least the same level of consistent success that you've had for years. Making people around them better. Uh, all of these type of things. That's what I think of when I think of a franchise guy. Just because in the sports world a guy might be the best player on his team does not necessarily make him a franchise player like I look at my Chicago Bears Jordan Howard may arguably be the Bears best player he is not a franchise guy Walter Payton was a franchise guy he was that guy that you built everything around. It was just unfortunate because for several years he was stuck with an incompetent front office, an incompetent organization before things started to turn around. You know, Sometimes guys are franchise players. They come into a good situation. Like Brett Favre was in Green Bay all those years. They enjoyed all that success. Aaron Rodgers was drafted. He waited in the wings three years. He got his opportunity. And frankly, the Packers haven't skipped a beat and enjoyed a similar level of success compared to the Favre era. But these are not just top guys that I'm mentioning. These are huge megastars, and they're huge megastars because they are the true epitome of a franchise player, a guy that can come in, like I said, and in some cases make others better around them. In most cases, you would hope, uh, especially in sports world, uh, the type of guy that can change your fortunes. Like you look in recent NBA history, LeBron James, the epitome of a franchise player. Just a matter of which franchise he happens to hop to to try and chase a championship. Before that, Michael Jordan. Like at the beginning of his career, when Kobe Bryant was drafted, you saw that franchise player potential. But Shaq was the franchise guy. Kobe later on down the road became the franchise guy, but he wasn't always. But you've had... A lot of great, very good players over the years in different sports that have been very good players. They've been the top player on their team, but that doesn't necessarily make them a top guy. And my whole thing with the Joe Flacco to John Cena comparison is, is just because Joe Flacco is the most closely associated name with the Ravens in terms of current Ravens players doesn't make him a franchise player. It doesn't mean that he takes them to new heights. It doesn't mean that they'd be a whole lot worse without him. It doesn't mean anything. He's just the name most closely associated, similar to Cena with the WWE. 
And when you look at Flacco, it's one of those matters of just because he's a quarterback and just because you pay him franchise guy type of money, that doesn't change the fact that for the most part, he's been a mediocre to average starting quarterback throughout his career who had one good stretch of a few games in the playoffs a few years back and his team won a Super Bowl. But you think about in terms of Ravens history, Ray Lewis was the franchise player, never a guy like a Joe Flacco. And if a guy like Joe Flacco is, you want to say, your franchise player, which I disagree with that assessment entirely, then what does that say about your franchise? I look at my Chicago Bears, Jay Cutler, most closely associated with that franchise for eight years. He didn't take that team to new heights. They didn't enjoy consistent success. He didn't make others around him better. Jay was who Jay was, and Dolphins fans, you're finding out what the hell I tried to warn you about. Just because he was a quarterback and just because they paid him Aaron Rodgers-like money didn't make him Aaron Rodgers. It didn't make him a franchise guy. Jay Cutler was the top guy by default. He was the top guy by position. He was the top guy by name. And that is it. But ultimately not a franchise player. And when I look at somebody like a John Cena... And I hear some of the defenses. I'm sure we'll get in the comment section too. He moved the most merch. He was at the top for so many years. And da 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 da. And on and on and on. He's the name most closely associated. Again, just because you're the name most closely associated doesn't necessarily make you a franchise guy. If you want to talk about the argument of he moved the most merch over the years, well, it became really easy for him to move the most merch over the years when he had twice the amount of merchandise available and he had twice to three times the inventory at any of the live events or on the website to ensure no matter what that even if anybody else's merch did get more popular see cm punk at one point in time perhaps see some other guys that could have gotten to that level they were never going to it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy you make this a reality because of the things that you do that doesn't mean it's inherently true you force it to be true And that's what you think about when you talk about Cena's merch sales and talking about, well, Cena's been the top guy for so long because ultimately the WWE forced it to be that way. They made it that way. It didn't matter during that decade plus of doom from Cena if anybody else would have ever gotten to a point that they could have potentially taken over the reins. It wasn't going to happen because the WWE wasn't going to allow it to happen. And I think back to the summer of punk in 2011 and how terrible and horrible of an abortion of a storyline that was. And ultimately, we talk about the creative team and we talk about this and we talk about that. But the single number one reason that the WWE screwed that thing up was by design because you already had Cena versus Rock as the main event of 28. You didn't want to make Cena look bad. You didn't want to have anything else potentially take the luster off of that main event match down there in Miami. So they didn't give a shit about that Summer of Punk thing. It was just something to get them through the next few weeks. And that's exactly what it was. Even though maybe at that time you had a time, a place, a chance that somebody else could have been the franchise guy for WWE, in this case Punk, it was never going to happen because the WWE wouldn't allow it to happen. And it's such a ridiculous argument to say, well, he was the top guy for so long. Well, what the fuck does that mean? Number one, it was never even the design for him to be the top guy to begin with. That was Lesnar. And then once Lesnar went because he wanted to go play foosball for the Vikings back in 2004, it was him, it was Orton, it was Batista, it was Edge, what I've always referred to as that fortunate four. The four guys that the WWE looked at and they said, you know, we don't have to worry about them leaving like Austin, Rock, Lesnar to do other things or this or that they're younger guys with the exception of Batista but they're guys we feel like we could put in a position to make a certain amount of money in order to stay profitable but again we could potentially have them for years and we don't run the risk of them going off and doing other things that's why those guys as much as anything else were at the top for that number of years and it's that simple But again, when we're talking about Cena being a franchise guy, when you think about the history of wrestling, and specifically the WWF slash WWE, Hulk Hogan was a franchise player. He made others around him better. The company enjoyed, at that time, unparalleled, unrivaled success based off of the work and the character and the performance of Hogan. He was that guy. He expanded that company. He helped take that company nationally and then internationally. He got it. Mass amounts of mainstream attention. Hogan to this day, I still believe, is the only 
wrestler to grace a Sports Illustrated cover in terms of professional wrestler. Hogan's the one. And that was over 30 years ago, granted, but I think everybody agrees. Hogan was the franchise guy of that time frame. And then you look at the Attitude Era, the Monday Night Wars time frame. People point to Austin and The Rock as the franchise guys. You had two of them at that time. How fortunate can you be? And to a large degree, you are right, and I will agree with that. Although I still believe fundamentally that the true franchise guy of the Attitude Era was Vince McMahon because ultimately everything on that television for years, at pay-per-views for years, funneled up to, through, and around Vince McMahon. The whole era kicked off because of Vince McMahon. McMahon. But if anything, if we want to just sit there and say this, you could argue that in that time frame, you had three franchise guys. I would still lean towards in part also because he was the owner of the company and by design, everything was going to funnel around him. Vince was the true franchise guy, but it's somewhat similar to Cena in the sense that if you make it that way, you can pretend it to be a reality and so forth. The difference was is Vince's time at the top was vastly more successful than Cena's. Cena being the top guy for all these years doesn't make him a big-time star. If he was truly that great of a talent, if he was truly that big of a star, then he would have been long since out of the business because companies and movie studios... TV studios would have been coming to him seven, eight years ago trying to get him away from wrestling to come do stuff, especially as The Rock started to enjoy more and more success in Hollywood to the point where he's arguably the biggest star in Hollywood. Why would you not want to go back to that wrestling world to find somebody else who's been acting for years, even though I don't know what you call Cena's acting as acting? Why would they not want him? Because he's not that type of guy. And it's so frustrating for me to hear people reference Cena as this big-time franchise player. They did not enjoy sustained, continuous success under Cena over his decade of doom at the top. Plus, audience viewership continued to slowly, steadily decline. Profits... By comparison, especially if you adjust the Attitude Era numbers for inflation, which mathematically you need to do, are about a third to a half of what they used to be years back. So you can sit there and talk about, well, they make record revenues. Well, they do a lot of different things, including brand splits, so that way they run double the show. So yes, in terms of gross revenues, but in terms of the net figures, the net figures based off of the size of the company and their infrastructure is not all that impressive. That's why their stock price still continues to hover around the same range it has for over a freaking decade now. He is not a franchise player. It is similar to Sean and Brett. If you build your company around them, you are going to suffer. The WWF at one point in time built their company around those guys, and the company suffered. A wide variety of factors, not just blaming Sean and Brett. It's just that was the reality. And when you look even today... And you see this whole program with Cena and Reigns, where Cena is supposed to be still the franchise player, Roman is supposed to be the next franchise player. If he was really truly the franchise player, he wouldn't be performing with Reigns in terms of promos and such in front of half-empty arenas. I'm sorry, it just doesn't fly with me. It just doesn't. Just because you want it to be true doesn't make it true. And that most certainly has been the case for WWE for so many years. If Cena was so great, if Cena was so magnificent, why are they having Raw and SmackDown in front of half-empty arenas? Why does their television viewership continue to decrease? I get it. Again, we're talking about WWE. So along with the company, a lot of the fans start buying into the world's worst excuses. It's about the cord cutting. It's about this. It's about that. It's about everything other than looking at the real problems. And fundamentally, fundamentally, this is not even just meant to be solely a Cena bash piece, even though it is going to come across that way and many of you are going to receive it that way. And at this point in time, that's your ass, not mine. I don't care. The real reason... That John Cena was never 
and still is not a franchise player for the WWE is ultimately the WWE made it that way. Especially with what went happened with Brock Lesnar on the heels of Austin and Rock leaving in 2002 for all intents and purposes, you know, in terms of full time, and then Lesnar choosing to cut tail and run after WrestleMania 20. The company was in a really, really tough spot. They were in a bind. They didn't anticipate this. They didn't think they were going to have to do this. So they had to rush a Randy Orton. They had to rush a Batista. They had to rush a John Cena before they were potentially thinking about it or even ready to. They didn't have a choice. But ultimately, the company made that decision at that time that they were never truly going to make a super, super franchise player megastar Because they didn't want to invest a ton into a guy just to ultimately have him leave and not get a maximum return on an investment. And that's exactly what this company has done. It's part of the reason why the product suffers in terms of certain metrics. It's why the WWE Network numbers, even as they've expanded it internationally, uh, have been pretty stagnant. It's why the live event attendance is not good. It's why the television viewership football season or not continues to decrease. It's because the WWE made a conscientious decision that the only franchise player in theory that they were going to have was the WWE brand. They weren't going to be in the making of a megastar business anymore. They were just going to be about putting the brand out there. They were about the WWE shield, so to speak. And that was the thing that they were going to market and build up more than anything else. So ultimately, long term, what happened as people started to like less of what the WWE had and what the WWE represented, the brand suffered. Now you also don't have the megastars. It leads to a decrease in viewership, a decrease in live event attendance, a decrease in net profits compared to uh, previous years. And that's by design. The WWE did this. The WWE made Cena the top guy. But top guy does not mean franchise guy. Because we could sit there and argue back and forth about whether they would have put guy A, B, C, D, E, F, and G in that spot. Whether they would have been able to do the same thing or not. To me, part of the thing about being a franchise player is that there should be, in theory, unless another one just like him comes along which sometimes happened but sometimes doesn't, I reference the Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers thing, you know, the fact that the Packers still have all that sustained success over the years under Rodgers, just like they did with Favre, doesn't necessarily diminish Favre. It just means that Aaron Rodgers is just that great and, frankly, better. But you look at the WWE and what they did, How could we sit there and even make that comparison? Because for so many years, you had no choice. For so many years, the WWE made it that way where there was no other choice. There was no other option. So honestly, whether you're arguing that he is or I'm arguing that he's not, none of us really fucking know because we have no relevant point of comparison to point to and say during that time frame, if somebody else would have been at the top, it was this. When somebody else was at the top, it was that. We don't have that. Even during the Attitude Era, you had periods where Austin was out. So you could look at The Rock and say he also had franchise guy ability. You could say the constant during that time was Vince. He had franchise guy ability. You could say, well, with Hogan, they pounded him down everybody's throats. And I'm going to tell you this much. When you enjoyed the level of business success that they did with Hogan all those years, you best not sit there and rock the boat. You better not cook the golden goose when you don't need to. Period. Different time, different situation. That's not to guarantee an 80s Hogan would come into today's WWE and be a franchise guy. Probably wouldn't be. Austin, Rock, same thing. Probably wouldn't be. And the truth is, how the fuck could anybody really truly be a franchise player in WWE? when the company intentionally goes out of its way to not make megastars. From a wrestling standpoint, to be a franchise player, you need to be a big-time megastar. If you're going to tell me that Cena is a big-time megastar, you're a clown. But that's not even just the fault of Cena. That is, again, largely by design of the WWE. Top guy and franchise player are two entirely different things. For years, Jay Cutler was the top guy on the Bears. 
Nobody with the football brain thinks that he's a franchise player. For the Ravens, by default, Joe Flacco is the top guy. He's the highest paid guy. He plays the most important position. But it doesn't change the fact that he's largely a mediocre to average NFL quarterback. He's just not. Like you look at the NBA and you say, okay, a Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, great players, stars, all stars, not superstars, not megastars, not franchise players. Guys like Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, those are franchise players. When you looked at the Cleveland Cavaliers and the way they were constructed, Kevin Love, all-star, Kyrie Irving, all-star, but there was an entirely different thing with a Kyrie Irving being the top guy for a Cavaliers team and a LeBron James being a true franchise player. Guys like Hogan, Austin Rock, Vince, they're the Jordans, the LeBrons of the world, the Steph Currys of the world. John Cena's like that Kyrie Irving type. He's like that Draymond Green type, that Klay Thompson type. Odd comparison, but the point is, if you build your franchise around them, it's not going to be nearly as good. Therefore, they're not really truly franchise players. They are just props. They just happen upon their franchise status by circumstance as much as anything else. And when you really truly think about it, that's kind of what Cena's been all these years. He has been very fortunate to be given the opportunities that he has. Opportunities that a lot of other guys would have loved to have had. Some guys maybe deserved a crack at and they were never going to sniff it, period. Like, I even call Triple H God, but Triple H was never truly a franchise player. Triple H was best when he was working with the guy, a foil for a guy that drew the real money. When Triple H is being pounded down your throat, it doesn't matter how much he's pounded down your throat. It doesn't make him a true blue franchise player. Things get worse with him at the top, not better. The same thing has happened with Cena all these years. Things got worse with him at the top, not better. So if your definition of a franchise player is a guy that was unchallenged by over, for over a decade because the WWE wouldn't allow anybody to challenge him, and when you got to a point where that could be a possibility, they did everything they could to artificially manufacture a situation where nobody could ultimately touch the guy. If you want to believe that a true blue franchise player for WWE is a guy that oversees a decade where viewership goes down, live event attendance goes down, and profits relative to previous years when adjusted for inflation have decreased significantly, then go ahead and enjoy that franchise player. But I'm sorry, it doesn't matter what anybody's going to say or what anybody's going to try and spin me on. I'm not buying this pro Cena propaganda crap. He was a top guy. He made a lot of money, and you know what? Good for him, because if he didn't, somebody else was going to. But you're not going to sit there and tell me that he was a big-time megastar, a real true blue franchise player. Because I think when you look at... Over the course of his career, and I think especially through the scope of history, you see how much things have changed and not for the better, and you see ultimately that he just doesn't measure up. And even again, let me emphasize this for the umpteenth dozen time, because I know some of you just don't listen. That was by design. The WWE did that intentionally. There hasn't been a megastar a franchise guy for the WWE in 15 years because the WWE made it that way. They have different points in time they have used props for what they feel they needed to have a certain baseline. That's not a franchise player. That is exactly what I said it was, is a prop. That's what Roman Reigns is, and that's what John Cena has been all these years, whether you want to admit it or not.